I'll be uh, talking uh, about the benefits of um, uh, taking patients with resectable pancreatic cancer first and treating them with adjuvant therapy, uh, which I strongly believe uh, is the, uh, the best uh, treatment for patients with this disease, uh, kind of, uh, to some degree. And I'll kind of talk about what I mean. Uh, but, but before I uh, do that, I, I will agree with uh, Dr. Berlin on a very important point, and that is that uh, surgery is our only chance to cure patients with resectable pancreatic cancer. Chemotherapy is certainly effective uh, for the treatment of patients with this disease, but uh, it alone cannot cure. Uh, that being said, uh, chemotherapy does prolong the survival of patients who have already undergone surgery. We know that from uh, these uh, European data, which randomized patients uh, who had completed surgery to undergo either gemcitabine for six months or uh, undergo observation, and patients who received gemcitabine did marginally better. Uh, these, these data, while uh, certainly justifying the use of postoperative chemotherapy, don't really justify the justify the the um, uh, a, uh, a de novo surgical approach, uh, but they are they do support the role of uh, both chemotherapy uh, and surgery. Those data were uh, supplanted, of course, and, and Dr. Berlin uh, reviewed these data in 2018, which randomized patients who had undergone surgery uh, to either um, uh, six months of fulfirinox or for six months of gemcitabine. And here, and I agree with Dr. Berlin, this was very exciting. Uh, uh, this was a very exciting trial. These are very exciting data. Patients who undergo surgery for resectable pancreatic cancer now live a median of almost five years in duration. So surgery uh, based on the data that I've shown uh, plus post-operative chemotherapy is the standard of care for patients with resectable pancreatic cancer. The question is, should it be? And to answer that question, I would say it really depends on what you mean by the word resectable. So this is how we've typically and historically considered uh, patients uh, to be resectable or non-resectable, purely on the basis of anatomy. Patients whose CT scans showed these three criteria, an absence of extra pancreatic disease, a tissue plane between the tumor and the superior mesenteric artery, and the uh, and a, portent, uh, a patent superior mesenteric vein and portal vein were determined to have resectable pancreatic cancer. But this classification system is antiquated and quite frankly ridiculous. Why is that? Well, first, because we know that patients with quote unquote resectable anatomy um, actually have a reasonably high rate of R1 or microscopically positive margins at the time of resection. There is a small group of patients who have who are very likely to have an R0 resection, but the, the, the uh, proportion of patients who are likely to have an R1 or an R2 resection is uh, significantly is significantly greater. Furthermore, we know that patients, uh, many patients who have quote unquote anatomically resectable pancreatic cancer actually have metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. And I completely agree with Dr. Berlin on this. Not only do they have metastatic disease, but that metastatic disease can often be measured. Um, we typically measure the CA199 level in this study, which looked at patients, all of whom had anatomically quote unquote resectable pancreatic cancer, were stratified on the basis of their preoperative CA199 level, as can be as would, would uh, be expected. Patients who had higher CA199 levels did worse um, because basically you're identifying patients who actually don't have uh, resectable pancreatic cancer for whatever, you know, whatever that means, they actually have metastatic pancreatic cancer. And it, at the, um, at the uh, extreme patients who had a CA199 level, despite an anatomically resectable tumor uh, with a, uh, uh, of greater than 1,000, had a median overall survival duration of about 11 months, which is no better than patients with grossly metastatic disease treated non-operatively. And finally, it really doesn't matter what the anatomy of your primary tumor is. If you, uh, as a patient, are, uh, adva have advanced age, uh, frailty, malnutrition, sarcopenia, cachexia, all of these things that we see in our patients, even those with quote-unquote resectable cancers that profoundly limit the relevance of surgical anatomy. So when you think about pancreatic cancer this way, uh, I would argue that most patients are not resectable, uh, whether it be because their tumors are anatomically borderline, their uh, 
primary, uh, their uh, tumor biology is such that they actually have metastatic disease despite uh, what appear to be a resectable primary, uh, or their condition is such that surgery uh, would be a futile uh, endeavor. So um, uh, the, these, uh, this type of definition is supported by uh, 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 ASCO guidelines, uh, which argue that patients uh, who have any of these problems, you know, advanced disease as measured by CA-19-9 level, poor performance status, advanced cancer, um, should actually be treated by preoperative therapy. But they do clearly state in recommendation 2.1 that primary surgical resection uh, of the primary tumor and regional lymph nodes is recommended for patients who meet all of the criteria, anatomically resectable tumor, low CA-19-9 level, good performance status, and these are the patients that I would argue have truly resectable pancreatic cancer. So why should patients with resectable pancreatic cancer undergo primary resection? So this is how we might argue that they be treated uh, with a preoperative approach. We treat them with chemotherapy to destroy systemic cancer cells, improve systemic control, uh, treat them with radiation therapy in an attempt to sterilize their tissues and margins, improve local control, and then play with time a bit such that we can select patients with tumors and patients uh, that have favorable behavior and anatomy, et cetera, for surgery. And finally, uh, offer pancreatectomy to that subset of patients uh, who do not have uh, 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 cancer progression uh, while on therapy. So there are a few goals of this approach. Uh, the first goal is to, present, uh, to prevent early recurrence. Uh, all, of, all of us have uh, seen early recurrence following uh, surgery. Sure, that's true, but here are our data from MD Anderson. Most of these patients were treated uh, with uh, preoperative therapy. These are data that I published back in 2009, so granted none of them received fulfirinox or anything, but long story short, most of our patients um, who received preoperative therapy uh, prior to surgery um, recurred within the first two years. And even with systemic chemotherapy with fulfirinox, plus or minus radiation, 80% of our patients who undergo surgical resection um, uh, uh, recur. 80% of those patients recur within two years. Another reason you might give preoperative therapy is to quote unquote, shrink the cancer. We've shown this is completely unnecessary. And not only that, it's really unlikely. This is a, these are uh, patients who have borderline resectable cancers who uh, received chemotherapy uh, most receive radiation prior to surgery. 84% um, or pardon me, 69% of patients with borderline resectable anatomy um, had stable disease following uh, their treatment. So the tumor did not shrink. Uh, and despite that, 83% of those patients with stable disease still underwent, uh, underwent resection. So again, we might, we might plan to give chemotherapy and radiation to shrink the tumor, but it doesn't happen and it's not necessary anyway. Uh, what is common, on the other hand, is progression. So these are 226 patients uh, with quote-unquote resectable, uh, resectable pancreatic cancer who received preoperative therapy. And as, sorry, and as you can see here, 21% uh, of those patients uh, did develop uh, metastatic progression while on treatment. And while I grant you that these patients weren't all considered resectable in the way that I've defined it, um, metastatic progression can occur while on preoperative therapy prior to again, curative surgery. Uh, we might give uh, chemotherapy to uh, gain, a, gain a, uh, uh, some uh, response to the treatment to kill the cancer. Um, and that's a, certainly a laudable goal, but it rarely happens. These are our data which showed uh, that um, patients certainly do uh, have, a, have a, a nice survival curve if we kill 95% of their cancer. Uh, with systemic chemotherapy prior to surgery, uh, but that only occurs in about 4% of patients. Um, finally, uh, you know, it's important to note that if you have a patient with a resectable cancer and treat them with chemotherapy, um, that is time within which uh, complications can develop uh, from, um, from um, biliary obstruction and uh, biliary drainage. So these are multiple series which showed that um, uh, biliary uh, obstruction and drainage is, is accompanied by complications uh, both prior to and following surgery. I would also note that most patients don't present uh, in an absence of biliary obstruction, they present with, uh, with high bilirubin and those patients can get chemotherapy 
until the early ribbon drops, so their, their treatment is delayed. So to summarize, cancer recurrence is common even following preoperative therapy. Shrinking the tumor is completely unnecessary and is uncommon following preoperative chemotherapy. In contrast, progression is common. Preoperative chemotherapy rarely kills the cancer and surgery obviates the need for, vil for biliary decompression. So if you consider uh, the definition of resectable the way I've defined it, anatomic resect resectable, anatomically resectable, biologically resectable, and physiologically resectable, then the best treatment for those patients is uh, surgery de novo, followed by uh, fulfirnox. Again, these patients anticipated to have a survival duration uh, on average of approximately five years.